So each and every week on, I say on this show, representation matters. But there are some hard truths to consider about representation. Now, we elected the first black president two, two times. Racism and white supremacy didn't magically go poof and disappear. There is no post-racial America or whatever they were calling that. And now with Vice President Harris being the first woman of color to hold the office, women of color continue to face pressing issues, many of which highlight I highlight on this program every night, because you watch. In an op-ed for The Cut, contributor Camone Felix argues that real representation hasn't yet been achieved. She writes, figureheads of democracy are just figureheads unless the tools of democracy belong equally to the people furthest from the power structure. She goes on to say, racial representation doesn't inherently constitute the ability to change structural functions of power. And joining me now is Kamon Felix. So, Kamon, in your in your piece, you mentioned that you don't believe there's been real representation for people of color. What do you mean by that? Look, I think that there's been plenty of representation, right? But representation that actually moves us forward comprehensively has been really hard to come by, in part because uh, breaking through the glass ceiling and becoming the first requires an allegiance to the original intentions behind any role of systematic power and leadership. Um, you know, the fear is that otherwise we'll lose opportunities at having power unless we follow those rules and engagement. But part of the transition that I think is and should be happening at this point in you know, in the curve of justice is that the less first there are, the more room there is to think critically about what we can actually do with those systems of power. So for instance, I say this in my story, perhaps President Obama wanted to act up and really push at the limits of the executive power. And he may not have felt, have felt like he could do that. But the next black president, because they may want to be the first to hold themselves to a totally different standard of accomplishment, one that matches our evolved understanding of justice, which is not just about economic power, but about power that lives and elevates Black Americans across all classes, all backgrounds, with particular emphasis on the people furthest from the corridors of power. Now that we've moved past the first, perhaps a Black president who is focused on that will have a lot more room um, to make representation true to us. I mean, it, it's really fascinating to think about the limitations of representation in the context of this com conversation. Um, one of the other things happening, we were just talking to Melissa Murray about uh, the historic nominee coming for the Supreme Court, but also top economist and scholar Dr. Lisa Cook could be the first black woman to serve on the Federal Reserve. Republicans are calling her fundamentally not qualified, which I'm like, did they say that out loud and listen to the words? Because um, that is quite offensive. Um, I mean, what does that language actually mean to you? Like, what do you hear when you, when you hear them saying that? Are Republicans getting bolder here when they're pushing back against representation? And how does that factor into, you know, how much we should focus on it? Because obviously representation matters. Otherwise, Republicans probably wouldn't be so staunchly against it. I don't think that they're getting bolder. I think Republicans have always been this bold, um, especially when it comes to dog whistles around race and the way that we talk about black women. I mean, anywhere from welfare queen to the capital N-word, right, they have uh, really crafted um, and institutionalized language that oppresses us. Um, but beyond that, look, it's really hard to take anything Republicans say about race with any seriousness uh, because of the pool of Republican leadership we've got in office right now. I mean, take Marjorie Taylor Greene, no shade, but she was hardly qualified, at least based on the standards the Republicans have set, especially for black women. So we should really think very little, in my opinion, about their thoughts. Um, we'll continue to see more of these dog whistles, but part of the work that we have to do is move past some of the um, reactionary outrage to some of these statements. We know what they're going to say. We know that they're going to call black women all kinds of ifs, ands, or buts. But we know what's true. We've fought for these qualifications that actually allow us into those corridors of power. And we don't actually have to take any of those things to heart. We know what's going on. I know. It's like, we know what they're saying. We know what, what, what they mean. In terms of people in, in positions of leadership, one of the things that I think is important to understand is, you know, having more representation is one thing, but having more representation that is in there with the facility <laughs> and the ability to actually create change is a whole other thing. Um, so how do we actually create that world where we're not just electing a Barack Obama, we're not just electing a Kamala Harris, and the squad, for example, but we're also facilitating and, and making the ground, uh, you know, and the 
fertile uh, for the types of changes that the communities that elected them actually want. You know, this may seem counterintuitive, but part of what we have to do is in some ways move away from our emphasis on uh, electoral politics. This is not to say that voting is not really important, that paying attention to electoral politics isn't important, but so much of the work that's happening in black communities, especially around um, mutual aid, on uh, really dealing with resilience around COVID, is happening just through community, you know, community work, right? Um, both institutions and communities and individual organizers organizing communities who are going out there, finding the resources that communities need in the immediate to deal with the immediate problems that Black Americans are facing. And part of what we have to do is take from some of those lessons to really identify what is it that Black Americans are asking for. Are they asking for more representation? Are they asking for jobs, right? And does one actually constitute the other? I think asking those really hard questions based on what we're actually hearing directly from people who are uh, significantly impacted is the only way that we'll get a clear understanding of of what it even means to have representation at this point. You know, so for instance, if Biden, uh, you know, can, follows through on his commitment to nominate a black woman to the Supreme Court, you know, it, it, what happens when he nominates her, you know, even if she's qualified, if, if she's, excuse me, if she's confirmed, um, comes down to what kind of person she is, what her politics are, what her ethics are and morals are, right? Um, and so we know that race alone is not enough of an indicator to understand what someone is going to do with power. And that's why we have to get a little bit more specific than we've had to get in the past. Come on, Felix. It's always great to have you on. Thank you so much, as always, for being here, and please stay safe. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen, and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.